गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन टूडे वी आर हियर फॉर द टॉक ऑन डेटा साइंस ए आई एंड सोसाइटी टूवर्ड्स एक्सप्लेनेबल मॉडल्स टूडे स्पोक पर्सन इज प्रोफेसर श्रीनिवासन पार्थसारथी आई वुड लाइक टू ब्रीफ अबाउट हिम प्रोफेसर श्रीनिवासन पार्थसारथी इज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ कंप्यूटर साइंस एंड इंजीनियरिंग एंड अ डायरेक्टर ऑफ डेटा माइनिंग रिसर्च लेबोरेटरी एट ओहायो स्टेट हिज रिसर्च इंस्ट्रेस स्पैन डेटा बेसेस डेटा माइनिंग एंड हाई परफॉर्मेंस कंप्यूटिंग ही इज अमॉन्ग अ हैंडफुल ऑफ researcher nationwide to have won both department of energy and national science federation career awards he and his students have won multiple paper awards or best of nominations from leading forums in the field including siam data mining acm sig kdd vldb ismb www icdm and acm bioinformatics he chairs the siam data mining conference steering committee and serves on the action board of acm tkdd and acm dmkd leading journals in the field since 2012 he also helped lead the creation of osu's first of kind nationwide undergraduate major in data analytics and serves as one of its founding director so i would like to request professor shrinivasan to deliver his talk So it's a it's a pleasure to be here, um, uh, and uh, today I'm going to this is going to be a not a very technical talk, but more uh, uh, philosophical one um, related to the topic on hand. I'm going to try to connect data science, artificial intelligence, uh, and some of the challenges we face, in spite of the many fold successes that have been reported uh, in the public press in these areas. Uh, so as uh, He just announced. I'm a professor in computer science and engineering at Ohio State, um, and I'm here as a visiting Vajra faculty at IIT Madras. So, just to sort of set the stage for this talk, uh, and these are basic definitions. Um, there are many definitions for both of these terms: artificial intelligence and data science. Uh, these are two that I've selected, uh, in part because I think they capture the essence of what these terms mean. at least to me and again all the views i present today are my views um uh they are neither the views of ohio state university or the funding agencies that support me or iit madras so artificial intelligence can be defined as the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human or animal behavior so examples of this are things we do day to day perception the ability to translate or adapt ideas from previous experiences cognitive behavior similarly data science is considered to be an interdisciplinary field that uses various types of scientific methods drawing from machine learning data mining statistics mathematics um and so on uh and levering systems to manage and process large potentially large tracts of data in you know, in order to gain um increasingly what are actionable insights from that data uh the turing award winner jim gray often referred to data science as the fourth paradigm of science of scientific inquiry uh and this is increasingly becoming uh the case in today's world there are many many successes uh for both ai artificial intelligence and data science uh i list here five examples but these are just a handful of the examples that many of you i'm sure are familiar with um the ibm watson system uh has been used uh in both health applications as well as natural language processing applications and competes with the best humans in a form of quizzing um uh similar to in india quiz time and uh, similar kinds of things but they also do other things like help the sloan kettering institute uh make decisions uh help doctors make decisions about patients facing rare forms of diseases there's the um uh title of a nature um publication where recently um uh a the best humans in the world were defeated by uh, an artificial intelligence technology that was playing the game go go is and having played it i can tell you go is infinitely more difficult to understand in terms of the different possibilities than chess is 
and for many years, uh, computers have been outperforming the best chess grandmasters. So this was the first time where the computer handsomely defeated some of the world's best Go players. Uh, the thing I have on the far right here, um, that's an example of a robotic dog from Boston Dynamics. It's capable of opening doors, protecting homes, um, and they've shown other capabilities. It's one of the examples of what I'll talk about later, some of the early examples of multimodal, multimodal AI technology. And of course, I mean, we are increasingly seeing the use of AI in medicine, um, many different things. I have an example in this talk as well. And uh, of course, as I was just talking to someone, um, I was just mentioning, there's an increasing use of AI and data science technology for automated uh, driving. Uh, so examples like Waymo and uh, Tesla uh, from Google and uh, the Tesla company. So there are several challenges with handling these kinds of problems. And I'm going to list a few of them. The primary purpose of this talk is to spend some time thinking about what I think is the grand challenge for some of these, for getting some of these to be used in today's world. Uh, the first I'll talk about, um, and again, just to give some context, this talk was supposed to be given just after a panel. Um, it got rescheduled. Uh, that was going to talk about talent development in AI and data science. And so I was going to go with that as the starting. So essentially, we need people okay, who can understand and work and manage large tracts of data, understand and use and perhaps even develop new statistical models uh, or mathematical models drawn from linear algebra or even more higher order, uh, more difficult mathematical uh, methods. Uh, understand and use different types of AI technology and develop new ones um, for next generation systems. And abstract, this is something that is very important. I, as, as when I was introduced, I think uh, he mentioned that I put together one of the first curricula in, as an undergraduate program in data science in the US. And as part of that, one of the things we kept hearing from some of our industry affiliates is the soft skills. The ability to take a real world problem, abstract it down to something that you can use standard models for, take the results of whatever that model gives you, and then abstract it back up to the real world problem so that it gives you actionable insights. This is something that they'd like their the students they hire to have by the time they get there. So soft skills, even though it's somewhat um, underrepresented in today's curricula, is increasingly important in this area. Now this has been noted by many publications. So there was a McKinsey report in 2011 that projected a shortfall of talent in this area. Uh, as in, there will be many more jobs in this area and fewer people, much fewer, much lower number of individuals who are capable of achieving this at both the entry and at the experience levels. So that was part of the decision making process for us to create an undergraduate program. Um, and universities and organizations are paying attention to this. Um, IIT Madras has this interdisciplinary data science program. Our university at Ohio State has several. There are uh, some of these programs at the undergraduate, graduate, and certificate levels. So this is a challenge I believe we are well on our way to resolving. The second challenge that I'm going to talk about is related to infrastructure. So many of these data science problems are increasingly complex, and I'll, I'll give some examples of that shortly. And as you have more and more complex models, you need more data often, and you need to be able to manage more data. And you, in many cases, you have to react, depending on the application, in real time. So you need powerful systems that are accessible. The notion of a thin client versus a thick server. You need systems that give you application programming interfaces that are feature rich. The ability to support versioning, authentication, persistence, and so on. And in many of these cases, you need specialized input from the application domain, you may need to have it be real time, you may want to engage a human. So if you have a human sitting in front of this system, you want to be able to react in reasonable time so that the human the domain scientist doesn't get um, you know, distracted. So you want to be able to respond pretty quickly. So again, cloud computing solutions um, 
have sort of really offered promise in this direction, but more research needs to be done. But again, this is a challenge I believe we'll be able to resolve. Uh, we have enough um, going on already that I believe this is something that we are well on our way to resolving for these kinds of problems. The third problem relates to data, and especially as it relates to data sanitization. There's data everywhere. You get from point A to point B, whether you know it or not, there are hundreds of sensors collecting information about that trip. Okay? So every car has of the order of 200 to more than 1,000 plus sensors on it. Okay? Um, so, and every time you check in, you go through the, recently at IDM, they've moved to an electronic system now, where instead of the guard giving you something handwritten, now it's electronic. They just look at your license plate press a button on this um, uh, UPAL-like system and um, out generates a receipt that you can put on there. So again, more and more data collected in all walks of human endeavor. And of course, this is nothing to say about you know, the social networking, the WhatsApp, the Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So lots of data. And we are increasingly spending a lot of time trying to sanitize this data, trying to better understand how to protect users. Um, so not just protect users, but oftentimes there is an impedance mismatch between what kind of form your AI technology or data science technology. So some of them will require something in a matrix format. Others will require something in a relational format. Yet others will require something in a graph format. So you have to transform your data to match uh, what the algorithm is expecting or what the methodology is expecting. Uh, it may in some cases require vector data. So in which case you have to convert a graph to a vector. Okay? So you need to spend some time thinking about what is the right transformation um, and in order for it to be ready in order to use whatever AI or data science technology. This kind of data cleaning or data sanitization often takes more than 90% of the total workflow time. So you need to understand that this is a challenging problem. I, again, there are some very nice solutions in place for this. Um, so, so again, I, this part of this data sanitization challenge, we're well on our way. However, um, it's important to understand, and the, the second part of this data sanitization challenge that I think we have to worry a little bit more about is that data can both be an asset in terms of uh, for the consumer, for the company, that is trying to analyze this data, but it can also be a risk. The risk is associated with misuse of the data and misuse of the data for control. Okay? And so this, these risks have to be understood, have to be mitigated. Um, the other aspect you have to understand here is that even though data is widely available, you don't have enough data on some problems. Take a rare disease, okay? uh, or take uh, the example I have on the slide here, which is traffic uh, in India. Uh, it's unstructured. Okay? So if I take a Tesla or one of these automated vehicles that people have developed, automated technologies that people have developed, and run it on Indian roads, will it work? The answer is no. Okay? It'll come to a full stop if it sees something like this. It's not going to move. Okay? So it's not going to get you from point A to point B in these kind of unstructured driving conditions. Okay? So we don't have enough data. The problem is we don't have enough data collected on these kinds of things. I know companies in India are thinking about this. And they're trying to come up with strategies to collect and work with this kind of data. But my high level point is you have to understand the assets and risk, the asset and risk equation, the risk reward ratio, and you have to understand in certain domains, including rare diseases, data is still somewhat limited. Here's another example. So um, this is, um, so many of you I'm sure have worked, uh, have used Amazon or Flipkart or something like that. So Amazon a few years ago, a couple of years ago, came up with this new thing where if you were one of their prime users, Amazon prime users, you could get same day deliveries in about 24 metros in the US. Um, what I'm showing you here are, in each of these six metros, the areas where that same day coverage was given. 
and the stuff in white are areas that were not covered. Now, if I were to re relay on top of these images a ori the, exactly the same map, but if I were to put on top of these images the racial diversity or how affluent the neighborhoods are, okay, what you're going to find is that these are the affluent neighborhoods. You see these structural holes in the middle, like Roxbury in New York City, uh, sorry, um, Roxbury in Boston, or the Bronx in New York City. Um, and Amazon, as part of their data science program, had figured that these were areas that it's going to be difficult for whatever reason. Now, unfortunately, this is not fair to the citizens of Roxbury or the citizens of Bronx, because they lie just outside this prime uh, delivery area. So again, more work needs to be done in order to accommodate or account for these kind of fairness issues. So even though data is being used f to improve perhaps the consumers who are in the blue areas, the people in these white areas are left out. Okay. So Bloomberg came out with this publication and there are many issues like this. I mean, we've all heard about Cambridge Analytics and Facebook with the elections and many, many examples like this. So there's a lot of interesting work that can be done as a, uh, both in computer science uh, as well as in philosophy in terms of counter or in terms of uh, mathematics uh, in terms of counterfactual reasoning and things like that in order to improve algorithms to be fair. So that's the third challenge, the data challenge. The fourth challenge that I'd like to think about here is related to the legal or regulatory issues. So I was just talking to um, this gentleman who's, uh, who was affiliated with the TBS group uh, and was working, ha had said he's been working for about four decades in the automotive industry. And one of the challenges is if you have automated vehicles and they get into an accident, whose fault is it? Is it the fault of the person who bought that vehicle? Is it the fault of the manufacturer of that car? Or is it the fault of the chip designer or the designer of the AI technology? How do you associate liability for these kind of issues? One has to have a better sense of some of the regulatory frameworks. One has to understand how these things work. Another example, okay, and related to this figure here. So this cyberborg-like figure here, okay. Um, if let's say you have a Fitbit, okay and you go running in and around the park. And let's say some crime happens in that park. The police come to your house. So in the US, we have this thing called the Fourth Amendment, where in order to search and seize something from someone's house, they need to have a warrant, okay? And then there's the Fifth Amendment, where you can plead not to give evidence against yourself, okay? You see this in the Hollywood movies all the time. So a lot of people here are probably familiar with the idea of the fifth amendment. So what about Fitbits? Or what about these uh, eyeglasses that have information about where you were? And what about access to the data that's being collected by this, not within your house, but by third parties? Where does this fit into the equation? Some legal scholars will argue that the Fitbit and this camera are really part of your, is an extension of your thought process. And so should not be something that police and government agents can seize from you. Whereas other sides, there are people on the other side of the equation who do think that. So one of my colleagues uh, has been looking at some of these issues. In Europe, you've all heard of the general data protection uh, regulation. It requires a host of things, including the ability to explain the technology to the end user, okay? This is very, very difficult with today's technology. As I said, most of our data models are increasingly complex. So this is very, very difficult to do. Um, and again, I, I'll talk more about explainability. The rest of my talk is gonna focus on that. And within India, recently, uh, there was about a 160-page document uh, released by the Sri Krishna Committee. He's one of the justices in India's Supreme Court. Um, and they talk about many of the things that we talk about in the GDPR framework. But the challenge with all of these, okay, remains how to operationalize this kind of work. It's great ideas. These are great ideas, great suggestions. 
But how do you get to a point where you can operationalize these ideas? That's, that's the key question. And we're just at the point taking baby steps in the regulation space. Um, okay, so just to take a step back, when you think about AI technologies and data science, you have a lot of leading lights. The physicist Stephen Hawking said, unless we learn how to prepare for and avoid the potential risks, AI could be the worst event in the history of our civilization. Now, his overall theme, this has carried a lot of public press releases based on this comment. Now, he is, uh, when he was alive, he was still confident we will resolve this. But his point was that if we don't look into the regulatory aspects, we are going to be in trouble. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, okay, says humans should be worried about the threat posed by these artificial intelligence uh, agents. Uh, Elon Musk, he has a lot of comments about AI. Uh, one of them, one of the more um, normal ones, I would say. He tends to go a little on the extreme side. Uh, he says, worth reading this book, Super Intelligence by Bostrom, Neil Bostrom. We need to be super careful with AI, potentially as dangerous as nukes. And Elon Musk and Bill Gates and several others were part of 116 or 114 individuals who wrote an open letter to the United Nations suggesting that we should have a ban on what they refer to as killer robots. I mean, all important points. Musk, again, going back to Musk, had this comment as well. So he was worried about mass employment. This is going to be a massive social challenge. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do. Are these things we want for humanity? These are simply things that I think will happen. Now, if you put this in context, historical context, um, there was a group of individuals, um, circa 1812 in England, who went about destroying various types of mill mills, cotton mills, and so on. They were referred to Luddites as the Luddites. Okay? And they were worried that these kind of automatons, these mills, were going to displace their jobs. And yet, we have survived. So I think we have to take these kind of things with a, pinch of, uh, with a pinch of reality, a dose of reality. We have to understand that some of what they're saying is indeed true. These are important things we need to think about philosophically. But there is some, um, uh, there, there definitely is going to be a way forward. So it's not all bad as some of these statements are. Here's another one. This is uh, a book I would recommend to anyone to read. Uh, there's a couple of things, reasons why I think this book is interesting. It's written by uh, a very famous mathematician, uh, Norbert Wehner. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about Norbert Wehner is along with von Neumann, he was one of the earliest to consider neural architectures. So in some senses, some of their discussions and some of their initial work on the notion of a neural architecture uh, was with uh, John von Neumann, the father of game theory, and also uh, well known for his work in computer architecture for setting up the instruction fetch decode cycle that most modern architectures sit on. So what he says is, and, and by the way, Norbert was a big fan of automation. So this book, by and large, mostly was spinning the positive parts but in this chapter, he spent some time thinking about you know, what we need to think about in order to better um, make sure that these kind of automating engines. And this was in 1950. Another interesting side note about Norbert Wehner, um, he was a good friend of PC Mahalanobis. He's visited India a few times. Uh, and some of his joint efforts with PC Mahalanobis made its way to India's five-year plans as well. So there's an Indian connection here as well. But what he says is, let us remember that an automatic machine, whatever we think of any feelings it may or may not have, is the precise equivalent of slave labor. Any labor which competes with slave labor must accept the economic conditions of slave labor. It's perfectly clear this will produce unemployment situations in comparison with which the present recession and even the depression of the times of the 30s seem like a pleasant joke. Again, keep in mind this was written in 1950. So the Great Depression had just happened in, 19, uh, in the 30s. 
Thus, the new industrial revolution is a two-edged sword. It may be used for the benefit of humanity, but only if humanity survives it, enough to enter a period in which such a benefit is possible. It may also be used to destroy humanity, and if it is not used intelligently, it can go very far in that direction. Now again, all of these, the central point of giving you all these different quotes from these thought leaders was all of them, if you, if you drill down and distill down what they're trying to say is that in order for such technology to be useful and for the good of mankind, we need to be able to explain what is going on. And we need to be able to explain it in a way at some level. And we'll talk about different levels at which ex such explanations can follow. Uh, it's, it's going to be required. And I'll argue there are three reasons we need to do this. First, as a scientist, I mean, it's a basic tenet of scientific inquiry. We, we want to be able to understand what we're doing, what these models are doing. Okay? Um, secondly, I believe that our ability to explain these models can help guide us to solving some of these other challenges, in particular, the regulatory challenges. Finally, and I think this is really important from a societal standpoint, um, and again, if you're worried about rabble rousing or these kind of Luddite-like behavior, um, if you can explain models um, to educated individuals, okay, or even the common layman, then that engenders trust. The economist Kenneth Arrow once said, trust is an important lubricant of modern society. And so that's why explainable models are essential. So what I'm going to do now is now get a little more technical. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the questions in the space of deep learning as it relates to explainability. And then I'm going to talk about um, um, some other, an, another case study. So deep learning is this uh, technology. Again, it's, it is sometimes known as representation learning. And it seeks to learn rich hierarchical representations of data uh, automatically through what I would consider multiple levels of feature representation or feature engineering. And so the idea is if you have an image like this, your initial levels, and I'll talk about some of these levels in a minute, but we'll find low level information about pixel boundaries or edges and things like that. Then some of the more, as you go higher up the hierarchy, you'll get some mid-level features like the eye or the nose or the mouth of the, of the tiger here. And then at the very end, it'll, it'll be able to recognize this as, an, as a photograph of a tiger. Um, and so this is the basic idea. It, of course, has, it's inspired from uh, the visual cortex of mammals, which has a similar type of hierarchy, a dual hierarchical behavior. Um, and at its, at its essence, each element in this deep architecture comprises some kind of a neuron element, neuronal element. And basically, the neuronal element takes as input certain features from this, from this image. And from that, there's some kind of nonlinear transform that takes place, and it produces an output. And with probability k, this is a car. With probability 1 minus k, this is not a car. There are different functions one can use to enforce this kind of thing. Um, there's also, I mean, there's a lot more going on under the hood, um, but these functions can have different forms. The original ones from the 60s were usually the sigmoid functions. Uh, then much more recently, there have been other types of functions. And then I think in 2011 or 12, I think is when the uh, rectilinear uh, uh, units started coming into play. And again, this is just a single neuron, but what really happens is, and again, what you're trying to learn is the weights and the constants from a whole bunch of data that has, uh, some of them have labels. But again, these are, that's just one element. Most current day architectures are incredibly complicated. So this is what AlphaGo used. It used two, uh, it used two deep networks. One is a policy network and one is a value network. It uses reinforcement learning, hierarchical representations with increasing levels of complexity. And I don't know what happened, but let me get back to it. Okay. So, um, and another deep architecture that um, was part of AlexaNet, 
Again, this is an extremely complicated architecture. So not just one neuron, but each of these has many, many neurons in them. Okay? And there are many, many layers. So these are incredibly complex structures. So here are some of the questions. And as I said, I'm going to have more questions in this talk than answers. Why do they work? Why does depth matter? There is some very nice theoretical work by Matus Tilgersky in this space recently. He's a professor at UIUC. Um, and there was a uh, tutorial on this by Sanjeev Arora. Uh, there are a couple of other ways of looking at this problem. Um, one of the things that people have shown is that the representation power as you increase depth is much better. And so that's part of the reason why depth matters. What do the weights convey? Okay, we don't know. What are the parameters to tune? How to tune the parameters? The search space is inordinately expensive to, to go through. What are the right loss functions? Um, and there's a zoo of architectures. I mean, just too many to list. Which one to use and when and why? What do they represent intrinsically? Can we go beyond high level intuition and debugging? That's sort of, these are some of the questions that uh, as a community, the machine learning community, really has to answer uh, before these kind of ideas can sort of be deployed in the wild in society. So there is some nice work in this space, starting from about 2014. So there are these ideas where Zeller and all um, in, in this work essentially showed how, at, uh, how they could reverse engineer some of these layers, layer by layer, to show that you know, the lower layers find sm small, the small features and the higher level layers tend to find more uh, clearly identified objects. So here you see this area, these kind of things here, the weights here are recognizing dog faces. Um, and, so, and here you're just identifying the eye of a bird or the eye of a dog. Uh, so going from increasing from layer two to layer five. Um, another piece of work that people looked at is when you have these layers and these neurons, and you, each of them has these, you know, you have this kind of information at each neuron. You now want to, as you go through these layers, you want to find which images in your data set or which data points in your data set activate this particular neuron the maximum. So this is the work presented on the right here. So they're saying that, you know, for this particular layer, this particular unit, these are the images that uh, had the highest values or activated these neurons the most. And so this kind of uh, top activated images work also came out the same year. Now more recently, there's this really nice work out of MIT um, looking at network dissection. They build on the idea of identifying the units and they take it a bit further. Okay, so this is an example where you have this complicated neural network. Okay, and this is some details about the network statistics. And then once you have the top activated images, it applies a segmentation algorithm to try to identify what are the most common features across all these activated images. Okay? And it finds that most of these are dealing with lamps within a room setting, within a bedroom setting. And so that's the interpretation of this particular unit. Then this unit over here, okay, this unit doesn't have as high a score. This one has a much higher score, so you're much more confident. It uses, intrinsically, it uses an intersection over union score. Essentially, how many of these images have that sort of lamp characteristic out of how much of the, of the image? Here, there's a bit of confusion. You have a few birds and you have some cars. But cars are, there are more cars than birds in this. So this unit it can be interpreted more as a car. So again, this is, this is uh, what mathematicians somewhat, um, some mathematicians would, would laugh at and say, this is proof by example. Okay? Not proof by counterexample, but proof by example. Um, so basically, not really a proof. But it offers some insight into what's going on inside these architectures. So this is another example. So this is a, a video that you'll see. The original image started, so the original image was trained on uh, an image net. And then the neural network was trained um, on newer data, as new data come in. So now you can understand, you can start to see in this particular unit, and I'm going to go back and do this again. Um, so, hang on a second. Okay. 
So the original units were looking at certain types of cats or dogs or some kind of animal, dog. Okay? And then as new data comes in, that neuron becomes an expert on detecting waterfalls. So now you can start to see these kind of dynamics, try, try to understand these kind of dynamics. And that's really why I like this kind of work. So again, you can see the before after. They kind of look similar, okay? But, um, yeah. but the waterfall, of course, is a very distinct object than, than uh, parts of a dog or cat. Now again, all of these methods, deconvolution networks, dissection, and things like that, they help us try to, they, they, they begin to give us some insight as to what's going on inside these networks. But they don't give us any foundational arguments. And that's what we need. We need more foundational work here. And, and, and moreover, many of these efforts are approximate. So they're, they're somewhat limited in terms of their explainability. So I'm gonna to change topics a little bit. Still in the same space of explainability, but now looking at some work we did um, a few years ago um, with a focus on a particular type of disease that impacts the cornea of eyes. It's a disease called keratoconus. It's a progressive, degenerative, non-inflammatory disease. The best you can hope for if you're diagnosed with it is control, kind of like diabetes, okay? But if you don't pay attention to it, it can lead to uh, blindness, and the only way out is corneal transplant. The diagnosis procedure requires, if, you, if, if the doctor suspects this, you go into a room, you sit in front of a device, and it scans different images from different, at different resolutions from your eye. The challenges to early detection is, is that it's akin to looking for a needle in a haystack. Very high dimensional data, features of interest, um, and at a scale where the signal to noise ratio is very, very low. So it's a very hard problem. Uh, what I'm showing you here is, is uh, images, late stage keratoconus and a normal eye. And so here you can see the difference clearly. But when you want to detect this, um, uh, at an early stage, it's very, very difficult to do so. So we were working with some clinicians, and I had a student who was looking at this. Um, the desiderata we got from the clinicians, um, these are clinicians who are practicing in the US, um, is it should be accurate and interoperable across different types of video keratographic de devices. It should be efficient, because we'd like to be able to resolve some of these questions while the patient is in the room so that they don't have to wait a long time for the results. And it should be interpretable. And this is the key where, where I'm getting back to explainability. Clinicians do not like black box models. Part of the reason for it is because they're worried about malpractice suit. Okay? Part of the reason for it is that if they're going to give, if they're going to trust a model, they want to understand what's going on. So we looked at a range of approaches. Okay? Uh, in computer science, uh, a lot of these kind of these, um, since this has this sort of spherical shape to it, we're looking, we're interested in spherical harmonics and things like that. So wavelets and FFTs we thought about, uh, we looked at different types of neural models, five layer perceptrons. We didn't go up to 157 layers, but we went up to five layers. Some of them did pretty well in terms of accuracy, but they were not interpretable enough for the clinicians to adopt them. So we were back to the, um, the drawing board, so to speak. So what then the student who happened to have a degree in um, vision sciences, and was also doing a master's in computer science, or computer science-like, uh, is that he had this intuition that you know, clinicians, many clinicians, are familiar with these infinite geometric series over the unit circle called Zernike polynomials. Think Taylor series, for those of you who haven't heard of Zernike polynomials before. So these infinite series that you can use as building blocks to sort of uh, capture the particular image of interest, the corneal, the shape corneal. These are orthogonal building blocks uh, in that you can sort of put them together like Lego pieces to build uh, the closest approximation to the shape you're seeing in the video keratographic device. Uh, lower orders like these, 
give you basic shapes, tilt, height, the initial height of the, the average height and so on. And then as you go deeper and deeper down the hierarchy, you get more fine-grained uh, harmonics. Um, this is a pretty compact representation. What we found is that they, uh, if we fit a model, if we fit a Zernike model to some of these images, we could go from features of size 7,000 to features representing these building blocks with coefficients with them uh, to about 66. So that was a, a two order of magnitude drop in uh, representation in terms of size. So it, it also had some nice benefits. Uh, more importantly, some of these harmonics here, I'm, I'm going to highlight these here, were things that clinicians had suspected. There were research reports already that it suspected these, these particular ones had some kind of role to play in detecting this kind of disease. So what we did was we took this particular um, representation, took the images from the video characterographic device, fit the model to it, mean square error fit. And we, our goal was to use these features, these feature engineered, and again, these are nonlinear transforms, okay, over the unit circle. And we use them to guide the clinician on why patients are classified the way they are and contrast them with other patients within the same group. Uh, the nice thing about these, since they are orthogonal, is that we could actually put them on one on top of each other and have clinicians look at things like this image over here, which is a decision surface that you or I may not understand but they would certainly start to see that here we're starting to see the early signs of keratoconus where the central part of the cornea is starting to rise. So color, as you go from blue to red, it's indicating the height of the particular uh, object, in this case, the cornea. So then what we could do is we could use these features and train a decision tree. Now a decision tree is just about the simplest model that one can construct, okay, amongst well, regressions, of course, but decision trees are fairly easy. And the nice thing about decision trees is a root to leaf path in a decision tree can be interpreted as a rule. And you can combine, since these are orthogonal models, so these represent the coefficients, the Zernike coefficients. These are orthogonal models. You can actually take the root to leaf path and superimpose the coefficient and the particular um, um, the, the particular coefficient and the value of the coefficient, you can superimpose them to create these decision surfaces like what you're seeing here. Most importantly, if you look at this one, C00, C22, and um, C33, and I'm going to go back to this figure. This is C00, this is C2 minus 2, that's what I meant to say. This is C33, and this is um, C minus 1, 3. Those are the ones that are being, those are the ones that are the critical decision making in this model. So once they saw this model, and they had this information about some of the literature they were familiar with, they were immediately willing to look at this model, study this model further. And again, what we could do is, as I said, we could give them um, uh, all the other patients okay, that fell into that rule. Okay? We could give an aggregate of those. We could just use the root to leaf path, give an aggregate of those, and tell them for each patient how they would defer from the, contrast that patient with the rest. So we could give them a full-fledged visualization tool and explain the model to them. Okay? The nice thing about this is that once we got this done, some of the, my colleagues, they ran some clinical trials with this. And now it's being used in clinics nationwide. Um, th this is a diagnosis tool for keratoconus. We did some follow-up work also for um, glaucoma. Uh, not as successful as what we are for keratoconus, but still promising uh, in that space. So again, this case study, again, gives you some further insight about if you can explain the model, maybe not to an ordinary layman or an educated layman, but if you can at least explain it to experts in that domain, then 
it can be used and trusted um, and levered within today's society. So that brings me to levels of explainability. Explaining the model to someone who doesn't have an education behind, beyond uh, the 10th class or the 10th grade. Explaining the model to someone who has a college degree. And this is what the GDPR legislation is attempting to do. This is very hard in today's world. Explaining the model to domain expert in context. This is what we did with the second case study for Keratoconus. Explaining the model to an AI or data science expert. We're starting, but we've only taken baby steps with some of the deep learning work that's gone. And again, to characterize, this is hard itself to, to explain this, explain some of these deep learning ideas to a, domain, to a data scientist. Getting it all the way over here is near nigh impossible today. But we'd like to be able to get to, I think, an ideal world is to get it to this level for all the technologies in use. I, I, I like to use the analogy of a car manufacturer, okay? I used to, when, um, when I was a graduate student, I used to change my, uh, my car's oil. I used to change spark plugs. Today I can't, okay, because you need specialized tools for most of them. But I had some understanding of the working of a car. Um, um, some of my friends were a lot better than I was. I learned from one of my good friends. Um, but the point I'm making is that there's enough people out there who know collectively how a car works that I trust myself within one, okay? So we have to get AI and data science technology to a point where there's, at least within context, there's enough people who can sit around and say, we can explain this, we can understand this, before it's going to see wide use. That's, that's at least my personal view on this. So even for a data scientist to reiterate this is hard. What does explainability mean? We need theory. What is the theoretical grounding for deep learning? Okay, or statistical models that we're using. What happens when data changes or the learning parameters change? Okay, both as a function of time or external factors. Okay, we've done a lot of work in this space in the biological context where you know, if you have amino acid starvation, this is what happens to a PPI network. Or if you lack water, if there's some kind of water shortage for that particular cell, this is what happens to a protein interaction network. But again, how do you generalize this? What if analysis? What does the model look like if I change my images? So one of the popular examples in the deep learning community, which is kind of interesting, is you have trained everything on a particular data set. You change, you manipulate the image slightly, okay? but it's not visible to the human eye. So you and I cannot tell the difference between these two images. But you've moved, messed around with the pixels a little bit, and you put it through the same model, it's going to get misclassified. Okay, there are these adversarial examples that people have looked at. So how does these, why do these minor variations cause the model to mess up, whereas we as humans can detect, cannot see any change between them? So the grand challenge question is, can we get a cause and consequence? This is a very hard problem uh, within a model. And of course, as with all things, there are trade-offs, okay? Many of the black box methods that we see in vogue today are highly accurate. If you try to bring in explainability into the equation, maybe you lose something in terms of accuracy. If you bring in explainability and fairness into the equation, maybe you lose more, okay? But there's some nice work going on by Junea Pearl and some of his students and some of his collaborators, um, as well as some work in the fairness community, John Kleinberg and others, looking at disparate impact and now more uh, more rigorously following some of Pearl's arguments, counterfactual reasoning and so on, for these kind of fairness things. So the grand challenge question here is, can explainable and scalable AI and data science match the black box performances of today? Can we equate to them? Maybe not, maybe, sometimes maybe yes. Also consider, from the business perspective, if you're an industry consultant, or if you're working in some uh, area, if you make everything transparent, like what the GDPR wants you to do, where's the business edge? Okay? You lose business value. If I answer, if I explain why I'm doing this to X, Y, Z, all the way to N, where N is a very large number, one, can be, one might be able to reconstruct the secret sauce 
within your company. So what happens to IP and business value in that case? So again, regulation uh, becomes uh, an issue. And there are domain specific consideration. Helen Nissenbaum at uh, Columbia has this, along with some collaborators, has this very nice idea, nice idea called contextual privacy. Uh, again, not related to fairness, but can we do something similar for fairness? The idea there is that if by some societal norms, if this is considered private enough, that's good enough. The problem, even though this idea has been around for more than 12 years, is that this is very, very hard to operationalize. Okay? Intuitively, the idea is great. It's basically saying is that we collectively here decide that this is good enough in terms of privacy, then that's what a company should be doing. Okay? The problem is, how do you operationalize something like this? Okay, because you have different viewpoints. Um, the sixth challenge, which again we're quite a bit away from, is general purpose AI and data science. I'm moving from explainability. Most of the current efforts are in a narrow space. So you have specialized engines that can play Go, another specialized engine that can play chess. Well, perhaps you can have one that does both, but can you have the same one open doors? Okay? Can you have the same one do some of the things a human can do. Okay? Um, so there are some nice projects. Boston Dynamics has a nice project in the space. Google has its multimodal projects. But we're not there yet. I mean, again, this is something we, we still have to go. Moreover, when we start talking about general purpose AI, this is where the Elon Musks of the world come in with their, their comparisons of AI with nukes. Okay, when he was talking or referring to the book on superintelligence, these are the kinds of AI technologies he was expressing worry about. So some of the challenges we've talked about, okay, regulation, data sanitization, explainability, become even more difficult when you're looking at general purpose uh, AI and data science technologies. So to conclude, okay, data science and AI surely offers great promise for improving society. Many, many walks of human endeavor. So it very much deserves some of the positive press it's gotten. Okay? Uh, but if we're not careful, it could suffer a public relations nightmare. Okay? And I think one of the key elements that we have to resolve for that is that we need to make some of these technologies much more easier to understand. Okay? At least to a data scientist, if not to a domain scientist. Uh, some of the key challenges, as I said, talent development and infrastructure are those that I think we're well on our way to resolving, at least talking about today's AI technology. Data sanitization, I'd say we're kind of there in some respects, but still more needs to be done with respect to privacy and fairness, uh, as well as certain types of more, slightly more narrower uh, problems that exist in that space. Regulation, we're just taking baby steps by and large. I don't think we, we have a good enough understanding of these models in order to figure out what the right regulation, regulatory mechanism ought to be, and it's going to vary by domain to domain. Explainability, that's what I've articulated, argued for. I think we really need more research in this space. And generalizability, we have some projects going on, both in industry as well as in academia, but uh, this is going to even further exacerbate some of these challenges. Um, again, to reiterate, I argue that explainable AI and data science is hard, but absolutely essential to today's society. Basic tenet of scientific inquiry, as a scientist, I want to understand what these models are doing. Uh, but not only that, explainability engenders trust. Trust is going to give us better PR, public relations. So you're not going to have some of these Luddite-style arguments um, and can facilitate fair regulation uh, in that case. So if general solutions are hard, can contextual solutions be operationalized? And this is where I brought in some of the ideas in contextual privacy. Can we extend that to contextual fairness of Nissenbaum and colleagues? And to reiterate one of the grand challenge questions, can fair, transparent, and privacy-preserving methods match the performance of existing AI and data science black box algorithms? So to conclude, I am really thankful for Ravi, Geeta, Manikandan at various points serving as my host during my month-long visit. 
which will still continue for the rest of this week. And of course, um, Dr. Nagarajan for arranging this particular talk. Uh, the Government of India and the Vajra program, and of course, IIT Madras, RPC Desai, uh, and uh, Computer Science and Engineering. Of course, my home institution as well. Many students, both here and Ohio State, whose work I've referred to, either directly or indirectly, and my mentors and collaborators, including my father, who happens to be in the audience today. Thank you very much. Thank you.